Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord, and Lord, in these days we're living in, sometimes it's so chaotic and there's so much going on that it's easy to get discouraged, even to lose hope. But Lord, I just pray that our eyes would be focused upon you and that you would be the one to encourage us and help us to shine for you in the days we're living in. As we go through our study in 1 Timothy this morning, Lord, and look at relationships, just help us to understand how we're to treat people, Lord. It sounds so simple and so silly sometimes, but Lord, it's so important. And I just pray that we're open to what your Spirit has for us. Also, Lord, as we worship you this morning, may these songs honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Good morning. We'll be reading today from Psalm 17. Psalm 17. Hear the right, O Lord. Attend unto my cry. Give ear unto my prayer. I goeth not out of feigned lips. Let my sentence come forth from thy presence. Let thine eyes behold the things that are equal. Thou hast proved my heart. Thou hast visited me in the night. Thou hast tried me and shall find nothing. I am purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. Concerning the works of men, by the word of thy lips, I have kept me from the paths of the destroyer. Hold up my goings in thy path, that my footsteps slip not. I have called upon thee, for thou wilt hear me, O God. Incline thine ear unto me, and hear my speech. Show thy marvelous loving kindness, O thou that savest by thy right hand them which put their trust in thee from those that rise up against me. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings from the wicked that compress me, from my deadly enemies that compass, compass me about. They are enclosed in their own fat. With their mouth they speak proudly. They have now compassed us in our steps. They have set their eye bowing down to the earth, like as a lion that is greedy of his prey, and as it were a young lion lurking in secret places. Arise, O Lord, disappoint him, cast him down, deliver my soul from the wicked, which is thy sword, from men which are thy hand. O Lord, from men of the world which have their portion in their life, and whose belly thou fillest with a hid result treasure. They are full of children and leave the rest of their substance to their babes. As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. This morning, if you would, uh, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 5 as we're continuing our in-depth study of Paul's letter to his son in the faith, Timothy. And keep in mind, Paul wrote this letter to Timothy um, to explain how we're to conduct ourselves in the church, which kind of seems funny. What do you mean? We, we, people didn't know how to conduct themselves? Well, things had gone astray, and Paul was there after his first Roman imprisonment with Timothy, and as he left Ephesus, he left Timothy behind to continue to correct these problems and establish, establish godly leadership in the church. Um, so yeah, it, this is an important letter, um, and I realize that a lot of people don't think this is a big deal. But the topic this morning, I think, is a very big deal. It's how to treat people. You know, It, it seems like it's, it should be something that's so simple, and yet it's something that's so difficult. I mean, my wife just had an encounter with uh, someone at uh, the billing department at a hospital, and it, she was so condescending to my wife. She basically was saying, you're an idiot. You don't understand the billing here. And my wife was trying to explain to her, look, we've paid this amount of money, but nothing has been deducted from the bill you just sent me. So how could that be? 
calm down, honey. And when you calm down, then very condescending. And how do we treat people? So I think we all, you know, need to know that. I think that's why the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write these things to Timothy. And I think the Holy Spirit is speaking to us. You know, some 40 years ago or so, I was working in an intensive care unit at a hospital in Chicago. And they hired this this organization to come in and to help the employees know how to treat people, how to speak to patients, how to treat the family members. Um, And they spent thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on this. And what they did was they brought this program in and then they wanted some of the people within the hospital to teach it. And they asked me to do it. You know, I was in my early 20s then, believe it or not, you know, it wasn't during candlelight, we, we had electricity, and, <laughs> and so they asked me to do it. I'm in my early 20s, I'm teaching people that 30, 40, 50, 60 years old, I'm like, they're going to listen to me? But that's what they wanted. And I, I said, why are we doing this? Why, I mean, why do we need a program on how to treat people? And they said, well people don't know how to talk to the patients anymore. Sometimes they're rude to family members and so on. They're not doing a good job. I'm like, man, didn't they learn that when they were kids? Didn't their parents teach them these things? That was over 40 years ago. And I think it's gotten a lot worse today. It's kind of a lack of respect for people. And we see it in the church as well. I mean, think about it. You know, years ago, we could have a difference of opinion and still get along. But if you have a different opinion today, you're hateful. You're intolerant. I don't like you anymore. Well, of course we're going to have difference of opinions. I hate to say this, but my wife and I have differences of opinion. And we love each other. So why has it changed so much in the world? Well, I'll talk about that in a few minutes here. But I think we've lost the art of communication. We don't know how to talk. We know how to text, but we don't know how to talk to people. This is an article just from a little over a year ago, June of 2022. And it starts out, Mr. Watson, come here, I want to see you. Those were the first words ever spoken via telephone. Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the then new, then newfangled contraption, uttered those words to assistant Thomas Watson in 1876. Today, Alexander Graham Bell would have been able to simply send a text to Mr. Watson. He may even have shortened the message of something like the letter U, busy, come over, without adding punctuation. Now that cell phones are everywhere and are a primary method of communication, some researchers have become interested in how cell phones affect the communication skills. There's no question that cell phones, particularly smartphones, have drastically changed society as a whole. They affect the way we do business, nurture relationships, check in with children, and socialize with friends. It's possible that cell phones have negatively affected speaking and listening communication skills as well. This is because in-person conversations benefit from visual cues such as body language, facial uh, expressions, movements. All of these visual cues can allow individuals to add a deeper layer of meaning to their spoken words. But even as cell phones have improved life in certain ways, they can also be detrimental. Since countless people carry out their daily routines without their, with their cell phones close at hand, it's often assumed that if you send a text to a friend or coworker, you'll get an answer right away. The expectation of near instant results can fuel a lack of patience in other areas of life. Text-based communication can also lead to misunderstandings because auditory and visual conversational cues are lacking in text messages. It can be easier to mistake gentle sarcasm for a rude remark. This may lead to a rise in misunderstandings and hurt feelings. Absolutely. I mean, we look at facial expressions. You know, if I said to you, how you doing? Would you feel the love? No, you wouldn't. Why? Because you looked at my facial expression. But if I sent you a text, how you doing? You're going, well, why do they want to know that? You see, we need communication, and we need to talk with people openly. 
and thus the focus of our study this morning is respect in the family. And, you know, obviously the birth, our birth family, um, yes, we need to be close to. We need to respect them. But I'm t I think Paul's talking about here our new, new birth family or other Christians. The church is described in many different ways in the New Testament, but the focus here, again, the church is a family. How we're to treat each other. And it's really kind of simple. You know, we tend to make things complex and try and, and dig in and extract all this stuff. But it's really, really simple because Jesus said how we're to treat each other in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. He said, A new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And by this all will know that you are my disciples indeed if you have love for one another. It's not a suggestion. Jesus is not saying, you know, if you want to do this, guys, that would be great. Just love people if you want to. I don't want to pressure you. Uh, just decide for yourself. You know, I understand that person may not be the nicest person, but man, try and love them if you can. No, this is a command that Jesus is giving to us that we're to love one another. Now, notice it doesn't say that you have to agree with one another. That's key. You don't have to agree with one another. We're not going to love, agree with people on all things, but we are to love them. And when you look at the church family, when they look, when people look at the church family, will they see this love flow? Or will they see these fights and disputes and arguments? You see, Jesus said, they'll know you're a disciple of mine if you have love for one another. I, I think that's interesting. And again, not an easy subject, but it really should be. And it's not an easy subject. Why? Because of the unholy trinity, me, myself, and I. I'm right, they're wrong, and how can I love them when they come against what I want to do, what I want to say? And again, I've seen that over the years, and it's not pretty. So respect in the family. I've broken these verses down into three main points. They're in your bulletin. How to treat men and women in 1 Timothy 5, verses 1 and 2. How to treat older widows in 1 Timothy 5, verses 3 through 10. And how to treat younger widows, 1 Timothy 5, 11. So with that as our introduction, let's pick up in 1 Timothy chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. And let's see what the Lord has for us this morning as we study his word and look at this topic of respect in the family. Paul said this to Timothy, Do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father, the younger men as brothers, the older women as mothers, the younger as sisters with all purity. So Paul starts out this section on respect in the family by talking about how to treat men and women. And he speaks about older men first. The Greek word is presbudios, and it's usually spoken of as an elder in the church, which it can mean, but in this context, it means someone who is older in age. And elders in the church usually were older in age. But Paul's going to deal specifically with elders, those that had the title of an elder or position of an elder in the church later on in this chapter. This is just basically focusing on people that are older. In Leviticus 19.32, we're told, You shall rise before the gray-headed and honor the presence of an old man and fear your God. I am the Lord. Isn't that interesting? In our society today, we've lost kind of that respect for the elderly. But in God's economy, it says it's not only right to hear them, but it's wise to listen to them. Why is it wise to listen to them? Because they've been they've experienced life. They've made mistakes and they've made things that were good. Learn from what they've been through. Proverbs 16.31, the silver-haired head is a crown of glory. It is found in the way of righteousness, if it is found in the way of righteousness. And it's not just having gray hair that makes you wise, guys, but walking in what? Walking in righteousness. Allowing God's word to flow in you and through you, that does. And really the word if in that verse, if it is found in the way of righteousness, is in italics. It shouldn't be there. It was added. 
The silvered headed or the silver head is a crown of glory. It is found in the way of righteousness. You see, there it is. Living a righteous life. That's the crown of glory. And again, we should respect people. We may not agree with everything they say, but we are to respect them. Weren't they created by God? Weren't they created in the image of God? Sure. Yeah, the, we're all created in the fallen nature. I understand that. But God still created them, and we should respect them. Now, here in verse 1, it says, Do not rebuke an older man. That sounds strange. What do you mean? We can't correct them? These guys that are older, they could do whatever they want? Absolutely not. You know, we can see how this is played out if we go to uh, 1 Timothy 5.20, where Paul tells Timothy, those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all, that the rest also may fear. You need to tell them that they're doing something wrong, not ignore their sin, but treat them with respect. Treat them as you would your own father. Don't lash out towards them with violent words. And there are times, yes, you have to rebuke a person. But the whole idea is to exhort them, build them up, getting them back on track. You look at Jesus, he was always interested in restoration, not destruction. But isn't it easy to tear a person down? Isn't it easy to destroy a person? Oh, absolutely. My sarcastic remarks can come out instantaneously. But holding them back and using words that can help a person is what's really important. But, you know, we do have buts, right? You know what? They're only getting what they deserve. They did this. They made their bed. Let them sleep in it. Well, that's not a good way to be. Because if we really think about it, are we getting what we deserve? No. No. Well, I'm a Christian. It's all covered under the blood. But are you getting what you deserve? Even as a Christian, how are you living out your faith? And are you getting what you deserve? No, God is giving us exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. You know, I always, when I'm struggling in these areas, I have to look at how the Lord responded in situations because that's what I need to do. I, I, my flesh really likes to justify my response. And let's face it, we're really good at that. But the Lord shows us the best response. And we have to have that same response in our lives. For the elder, respect them. Don't put them down. Paul says exhort them. And it's interesting, the Greek word for exhort here is perikaleo. It means one who has been called alongside to help. It's used of the Holy Spirit. And we, come, we should be able to come alongside and help these older men in the church, to encourage them, as you would do a father. And then Paul talks about younger men. And he says that we're to treat them as brothers. Now, I don't know about you, but, you know, I had... Three younger brothers. Oh, man. We, we had some great fights, man. Um, but we were a family, and we always got together. You know, we always fixed those problems. But here, we are to love them as Christ loves them. Exhort them, build them up, get them back on track. We all struggle at times. We all get off course at times. And isn't it wonderful to have a brother or sister in the Lord come alongside and say, hey, you need this. Let me pray for you. What can I do to help you? To encourage you. Or what you're doing is not going to be good for you. You know, Paul in Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, I think explains beautifully this idea. It says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, 
considering yourself lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Yeah, the idea behind the word restore is that of setting a broken bone, putting it back in place so it can heal even stronger. And when doctors set a broken bone, they have to get close to the patient. They actually have to touch the patient, right? Sometimes they're pulling on it to set it into place. We have to get close to people. We have to touch their lives. We need to guide them. You know, Ray Steadman put it like this. He said, hidden in that verse is another one of those profound psychological insights so frequently found in Scripture, which says that the way you treat people depends on, you, on how you see them. Paul is suggesting that if Timothy sees every older man in the congregation as a father, then he will treat him with a natural reverence and respect. How you look at other people is very important. In the world, almost everyone falls into the category of a rival who is trying to get the best of one or a friend whom one can use to get ahead. As Christians, however, we are, we are to have a very different view of other people. Paul tells this young pastor to look at older men as he would look at his own father, to view them as men with some degree of experience, men who have survived crises in their lives, men who have developed a certain degree of understanding and wisdom by virtue of being young a long time. Further, Paul tells Timothy to view young men as though they were his brothers. Again, this reminds Timothy that there is a family relationship involved. Young men are not rivals, his enemies, they are his brothers. That relationship speaks of openness and honesty with one another, and yet respect and concern for each other. When a young man sees other young men as brothers, he will treat them as such. Yeah. Why is there such a struggle today in this area? Well, Jesus said in Matthew 24 that the love of many has grown cold. And that's so true. You know, Paul, talking about the days we're living in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, gives us an understanding of all these things that are going to be going on. And it stems from one point, and I've talked about this before, but I mean, this is from the Amplified Bible I'm going to read from here, 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 5. It said, But understand this, that in the last days will come, set in perilous times of great stress and trouble, hard to deal with and hard to bear, for people will be lovers of self and utterly self-centered. Well, isn't that true today? You can't even tell a joke today without offending someone. You know, I hate to say this, but I grew up with Don Rickles, if any of you remember Don Rickles. Don Rickles picked on every single person. It didn't matter what color skin you were, what nationality you were, who you were, he picked on you, and everybody laughed. Now, oh, that's all offensive. We can't laugh. I laugh at myself all the time. So does my wife because I do some really crazy things. But we're so self-centered. He goes on to say, and these I think are the characteristics of being self-centered. Lovers of money and aroused by an inordinate, greedy desire for wealth, proud and arrogant and contemptuous boasters. They will be abusive, blasphemous, scoffing, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, and profane. They will be without natural human affection, callous and inhuman, relentless, admitting of no truce or appeasement. They will be slanderers, false, false accusers, troublemakers, intemperate and loose in morals and conduct, uncontrolled and fierce, haters of good. They will be treacherous, betrayers, rash, and inflated with self-conceit. They will be lovers of sensual pleasures and vain amusements more than and rather than lovers of God. For although they hold a form of true religion, they deny and reject and are strangers to the power of it. Their conduct belies the genuineness of their professional profession. Avoid all such people. Turn away from them. Those are the days we're living in. And yet there should be this stark contrast between Christians and non-Christians today. You know, have we lost the love for people? Or are we, is it all about us? You know, I, 
the church over the years has done a great disservice to the people who are involved in the church by telling them, basically, you can't help others until you help yourself. There's no way. My self will never be satisfied. You will spend a lifetime trying to satisfy self without helping anyone else. You know how you help self? By helping others. And when you reach out to others, it is amazing how your needs are all taken care of. For those that are struggling even with depression, get out and help people. It changes your whole attitude because you see, wow, there are people that are really, really hurting even worse than me, and I can help them. I can bless them. Caring for people, helping people, showing that you're interested in them. Even with evangelism today, there are some out there that think, you know, it, it's almost like, hey, I'm going out to witness, and if someone gets saved when I'm witnessing, it's another belt, another mark on my belt. Are you kidding me? That's not love. Care for them. It's not only witnessing to them and see them coming to know the Lord, then it's training them up. Now you are responsible, Jesus said in Matthew 28. You are responsible to teach them also. That's love. Now, as we move on into verse 2 of 1 Timothy chapter 5, uh, the focus is women and how we're to treat them in the church. And they're to be, older women are to be treated with respect like you would show your own mother. It seems so obvious, but Paul had to bring it up back in his day, and we need to hear this too. And when we correct older women, we do so with respect, with the idea of exhortation. And how important it is for older women to share with the younger women, to help them grow in the Lord. The lessons that they've learned through their life as a Christian, they can share and help them. What's interesting today is that older men, older women, um, pastors, their wives, they are not looked to, to speak at conferences as much today. Do you know why? Because they're old. Who wants to hear these old guys, these old women? We want the Hipster teacher, I've already told you that I'm old because I used the word hipster. But they want, you know, the movie stars, the rock star pastors and their wives to come up and teach them. Can you learn from them? Sure. But look at the knowledge you are just tossing away from these other men and women who have lived out their lives in Christ. I think that's why I love to hear Pastor Chuck as he taught because he had experienced many things that were maybe future for me or maybe that I was dealing with now. And yet he went through them and can help me, according to the scriptures, how to deal with those things. But those valuable lessons, don't pass them up. You know, remember Solomon um, had died the kingdom was going to go over to his son, Rehoboam. And Solomon, he was a great king. He had a lot of issues, though. Uh, but he, he was a good king, and he taxed the people heavily to build up the nation of Israel. And Jeroboam and really the whole congregation of Israel came to Rehoboam and asked, you know, hey, could you just lighten the load a little bit? Do you put this heavy burden upon us? We'll serve you faithfully, but just ease up a little bit. Your dad really was hard on us. And this is what we're told in 1 Kings 12, verses 6 through 13. Then King Rehoboam consulted the elders who stood before his father Solomon while he still lived. And he said, how do you advise me to answer these people? And they spoke to him, saying, If you will be a servant to these people today, and serve them and answer them and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. That sounds like very wise counsel, right? And then there's that one word, but. But he rejected the advice 
which the elders had given him, and consulted the young men who had grown up with him, who stood before him. And he said to them, What advice do you give? How should we answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, Lighten the yoke which your father put on us? Then the young men who had grown up with him spoke to him, saying, Thus you shall speak to this people who have spoken to you, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy, but you make it lighter on us. Thus you shall say to them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's waist. And now, whereas my father put a heavy yoke on you, I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king had directed, saying, Come back to me the third day. And then the king answered the people roughly and rejected the advice which the elders had given him. Can you imagine? The kingdom's divided now. Two kingdoms in the south, the southern kingdom of Judah, Judah and Benjamin, and the other ten tribes, the northern tribe of Israel. I can understand the young men because, you know, they're kind of fiery, right? Hey, we're not going to sit down and take this. We're going to fight back. You know, you tell them you're going to be stronger than your dad. A lot of boldness there, but it was foolish. Where the older guys were like, hey, you know what? The kingdom is built up now. Look at we've got the temple. We've got all this stuff here. You need to ease up on them. You can't keep beating them down. But he rejected the wise counsel of the older men. We need to listen to the counsel of older men and women. And for the younger women here, how are we to treat them? Well, as sisters. Not pulling their hair, guys. Don't do that. But love them as sisters. With all purity. What does that mean? Hear me out on this. Don't put yourself in a situation where you are ministering to a young woman And in so doing, it deteriorates into a sexual relationship. I never encourage men to counsel minister to young women by themselves because it opens the door for trouble. You can come with the purest of motives, but it can turn the other way. I don't counsel women by myself. I always bring my wife with me. And the reason I do that is because if there's a a marriage relationship problem and the woman's coming for counseling, and here I am, compassionate, listening to her, and her husband's not, it causes trouble. But if my wife is with me, it changes everything. And my wife is really good at counseling. She doesn't pull any punches. It's years of wisdom. I'm not saying she's old. but we're older than we were when we first came up. Be careful. I encourage men to minister to men, women, to women. And if you need to counsel a woman, bring your wife or bring uh, another uh, person with you. Because if you don't, you can give the devil an opportunity to cause you to stumble. Now, again, Ray Stedman put it like this. He said, Paul tells Timothy to treat the older women as mothers. I remember various older women who were like mothers to me as a young man. As a result, I learned to treat them with great respect for the wisdom and love they manifested to me. And you know what? Years ago, when we were in the other building, and, you know, like I've told you, you've heard this story, but we had just did all refurnishing of the building. I mean, we inside, we just, it was really nice. And we had a concert, I think it was that Friday night or uh, Saturday, and the owner of the building said, uh, Joe, I've got some news for you. You're going to have to get out of the building because the flower gallery wants your spot. I'm like, what? Unless you can pay, and it was like, $2,500 a month because that's what they were going to pay. You're going to have to go. I'm like, man, we were paying like $700 a month. <laughs> you know, we could never do that. 
And so I was like, oh, and I was so down. I'm like, how are we going to do this? We have no money anymore. We just spent it on fixing the whole place up. We have absolutely no money. And so we're there at the concert, and, you know, the spiritual person I was, I was moping around, and, uh, <laughs> you know, I was down, and, and uh, Diane was there. And uh, she said, how's it going? And I said, oh. We got, we're getting kicked out of our building. I don't know what we're going to do. It's just, oh, you know, and I'm, you know, doing my complaining. And Diane looked at me, and you know how Diane, with her, sorry, Diane, I don't mean to embarrass you, but with her big smile on her face, she goes, I wonder what God's going to do. You know what? It was the simplest thing. I wonder what God is going to do. Did I need to hear that counsel? Absolutely, I did at that moment. Absolutely, I did. It's what I need. It changed my whole attitude. I have to admit, at first, I was really angry with her. How could you say that? What's God going to do? Come on. What's wrong with you? And then it's like God saying, uh, yeah, I'm not done with you. Yeah, the counsel that you can get from people. Treat older women as mothers? Yeah. Treat. Um, or Paul tells Timothy that a young pastor should treat a young woman as sisters with love, with interest and concern, but certainly without any attempts at sexual involvement in all purity. You know, again, this is so simple until we have to put it into practice. You know, it, it, when you read the Bible, isn't it like, oh, yeah, this just makes sense. This is so easy. And, you know, Lord, just help me to love people. And what happens? God brings, like, the worst person in the world into your life. Well, God, what are you doing? You said you wanted my love. Go ahead, give it. Not this person. Well, then what person? See, God's always teaching us. He's stretching us. He's helping us to grow. If we want to be more like him, then we have to apply these things to our life. You know, Christianity is not just head knowledge. You have to allow it to sink deep down into your heart to become part of your life. Or it's empty. You know, it's really, we can know all kinds of different things, but if we don't apply them, what's the point? Be gentle, be respectful with the older saints in the body of Christ. Well, as we read on, how to treat older widows. This was a big issue back then, and it needed to be dealt with, and there's some application for us today. So look at verse 3 here in 1 Timothy chapter 5, where Paul wrote this. Honoring widows who are really widows. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. Now she who is really a widow and left alone trusts in God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. And these things command that they may be blameless. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Do not let a widow under 60 years old be taken into the number, and not unless she has been the wife of one man, well reported for good works. If she has brought up children, if she has lodged strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has relieved the afflicted, if she has diligently followed every good work. So how to treat older widows. Again, big concern back then because if their husband died they, and they didn't have a family to help them out to care for them, they were in trouble. It was hard for them to get work. How would they survive in that culture? And it's interesting how Paul starts this out. He, he says, honor widows who are really widows. I find that interesting. And the word honor means to support and sustain. We get our English word honorarium from. So it's supporting them with money, a gift of money to help them. And again, no government programs in those days um, that took care of the elderly. So they were especially vulnerable. 
And what would happen or should have happened is that the young members of these families were expected to care for their elderly mothers and grandmothers if they were widows. Now, again, most of the time, especially these older widows, they had nothing. In Mark chapter 12, verses 41 through 44, we see this played out. Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. And many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which makes a quadrants. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Surely I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. For they all put out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. She had nothing, absolutely nothing. In Acts chapter 6, we see a problem in the early church regarding the care of widows. In those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there rose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because those, their widows were neglected in the distribution. I find that interesting. It, the church is growing. People are coming to Christ. And what does the devil do? Wants to cause division. Wants to cause trouble. No different today. Then 12, the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over their, this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Par Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. So this was going on in the early church. These widows had some, there were problems. They, the, these Hellenist Jews didn't felt that their, the, their widows weren't being cared for correctly. So the apostles said, hey, you know what? We need to give ourselves over to prayer and the word of God. You guys pick 12 men. They pick out these Hellenists to oversee this ministry. But here we are when Paul wrote 1 Timothy 30 years down the road and there's still this problem on how to care for widows. And so Paul's giving these guidelines. God provides for the weak, the disadvantaged. In the Old Testament, we see this played out. In Deuteronomy 14, you shall truly tithe all the increase of your grain that the field produces year by year. And the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are within your gates may come and eat and be satisfied that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hand which you which you do. This was kind of a welfare system or program. You go through your field once, and then those who were widows, um, the poor, can come in and they can glean from the fields what all that was left over to provide for themselves. It was a good program. But if you took advantage of the less fortunate, God didn't appreciate that. In Malachi 3.5, it says, And I will come near you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against sorcerers, adulterers, perjurers, against those who exploit wage earners and widows and orphans, and against those who turn away an alien because they do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. Why were they doing these things? Because they didn't fear the Lord. How we behave, how we treat people determines are we obeying the Lord or disobeying the Lord. And here, Paul understood the heart of God for the less fortunate. And he says, yeah, the church can take care of widows who are in the church. And please understand, and I realize that some you know, don't understand this, but the church is not a welfare program. They're not to give to anyone and everyone who asks for something. We're to help, yes, but there are guidelines for it. How do I know? Well, here Paul just tells us, honor widows who are really widows. Don't let them fool you. Don't let them take advantage of the system. And believe me, over the years, you know, we get a lot of calls from people. And sometimes we help people out. Sometimes I know the scam. I know what they're doing. 
And I told you before, I had a guy, he had come to the church on a Thursday night with his wife, and, and I don't know if it was his wife or not, but that's what he said. And he said he needed some steel-toed shoes for work. And I knew that story was going around because I had heard it before. So I, you know, I told him, I'd be more than happy to go to Walmart. We'll get some steel toe shoes. He didn't really want to do that, but he told everyone his story. And people were so gracious to give to him. And bless your hearts, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. You gave out of a pure heart. And, uh, yeah, that was the last time we saw him. And then about a year or so later, I get a phone call. And it's from this guy. And he comes by. And I said, I'll meet you at the church. It was Thursday. I said, I come early on Thursdays. Just stop by the church. We'll talk. And he said that he needed to go to Mayo Clinic because he had this uh, pacemaker defibrillator put in, and uh, he needed to get it checked, and he needed gas money to get up there. I'm like, oh, that's great. And he said, and he always wanted to show me this device. So he said, let me have your finger. I'll show you. And he had this little knot here in his chest. He said, can you feel it? That's, that, that's it. I said, oh, that's, that's interesting. I said, you know, can I see the scar where they put the pacemaker in? Just open up your shirt a little bit more. I said, well, that, there's no scar. How in the world did they put a pacemaker in your chest without opening the skin? That's a miracle. <laughs> I said, I've been a critical care nurse for 30 years. <laughs> I know that this isn't happening. Well, then he, he just walked away. God does that sometimes with me. He gives me the wisdom. That was pretty obvious. And what to do. So here, these widows who are really widows. You know, Paul talks about it's the family's responsibility, first of all, to care for them. And that's important. But even back in Jesus' day, they didn't want to do it. They had excuses. How do I know? Because Jesus tells us, in, in, or Matthew tells us in Matthew 15, verses 3 through 6. He said, He, Jesus, answered and said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God. Then he need not honor his father or mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. In other words, they were getting out of caring for their parents by saying, all that we have is given to God. Now, please understand, they gave nothing to God. They just said they were given to God. So, the first qualification of supporting a widow is that they don't have any family to help them out. What else? Well, that she trusts God. She's not only saved, but her faith is strong. And because of the strong foundation, she intercedes before God for the people with prayers and supplications all day long, even into the night. We, we see an example of this in Luke chapter 2, verses 36 through 38. There was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years, who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fasting and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. 84 years a widow. And instead of complaining, she's serving in the temple all day long for 84 years. That's pretty good. Again, how important that is. You know, in verse 6, but she who lives in pleasure, indulgence, or indulgence, is dead while she lives. Wow, that's kind of harsh. What is that about? Well, the word pleasure in the Greek speaks of sensual pleasure. If they're not living appropriate lives, godly lives, then the church has every right not to support them. Sorry. Paul in Romans, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Is this person saved that Paul is speaking about here? Could be. 
could be in a backsliding condition or maybe they weren't saved and they're just pretending to be part of the church. And if you support them, you're just condoning their lifestyle, which was wrong. And Paul, again, hits them, and he does this a couple times here, hard telling, look, if you don't provide for your family, if they have to rely on the church to help them, then you're worse than an unbeliever. Wow. Back in those days, the pagans, they didn't care for their parents. And what Paul is saying is, if you do less than an unbeliever, man, what kind of faith do you have? You know, Warren Worsby put it like this. He has been my experience in three different pastorates that godly widows are spiritual powerhouses in the church. They are the backbone of the prayer meetings. They give themselves to visitation, and they swell the ranks of teachers in the Sunday school. It has also been my experience that if a widow is not godly, she, she, she can be a great problem to the church. She will demand attention, complain about what the younger people do, and often hang on the telephone and gossip. Of course, it's not really gossip. She only wants her friends to be able to pray more intelligently about these matters. Paul made it clear that the church helped widows, that church helped widows must be blameless, irreproachable. Yeah. And, you know, in verse 9, Paul goes on to say that they are part of the number. What does that mean? It means that there was a list of widows in the church. They had a list. Okay, these are the women that we are, widows that we are supporting. And it was an official ministry. And you had to be under 60, or if you were under 60 years of age, you were not enrolled into that. Why? Because if they were younger, they can support themselves many times or they can get remarried. And these older women are mature, not easily driven by desire, and they can serve the Lord faithfully as their life has shown. A one-woman man, faithful in marriage. And again, we look at these qualities, and it's just not only for widows. They're, they're for women, men to have in their lives. We should be honoring the Lord, serving the Lord in all we do. But treating older widows, yes, we ought to care for them, watch out for them if they can't take care of themselves and if there's no family to help them. But what about these younger women whose husbands died? Well, how to treat younger women? Look at verse 11. But refuse the younger widows, for when they have begun to grow wanton against Christ, they desire to marry, having condemnation because they have cast off their first faith. And besides, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but also gossips and busybodies, saying things which they ought not. Therefore, I desire that the younger widows marry, bear children, manage the house, give no opportunity to the adversary to speak reproachable fully. For some have already turned aside after Satan. If any believing man or woman has widows, let them relieve them or give aid to them, and do not let the church be burdened that it may relieve those who are really widows. So why these younger widows should not be supported by the church? Because they can many times provide for themselves or remarry. And Paul says these younger widows... Many can grow wanton, means to feel the impulse of sexual desire. Why? Because they're young. And they were still childbearing age. Back then they believed when you turn 60, the desire for sexual activity began to wane. They couldn't have children anymore. Praise God for that after 60, right? <laughs> but these younger women, they, widows could. And so this was important. Younger widows can support for themselves. They can get married. And, yeah, sometimes these younger women, their desire to get married overshadows their desire for the Lord. And so they get so involved and so focused on that. And sometimes they get into dangerous situations because they want to be married. You know, 
Paul in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 talked about that, that you know, if you're single, you could serve the Lord wholly with your life, but if you're married, you have to care for your family. Yeah, that's important. It's not wrong, it's just the reality of the situation. But in verse 13 of chapter 5 here in 1 Timothy, Paul says, And besides, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but also gossips and busybodies, saying things which they ought not. Too much time on their hands. And that's really for any of us. You know, you got too much time on your hands, you get into trouble. And they're gossips, they're busybodies, they're talking behind people's backs. They have so much time, free time, and they need to get involved. And so what does Paul say? He says, well, in verse 14, I desire that the younger widows marry, bear children, manage the house, give no opportunity to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Be so busy you don't have time to do these other things. You don't get in trouble. You know, the word opportunity in the Greek is a military term that means a base of operations. Don't give Satan a base of operations to work from. That's with all of us. When we're sitting down, when we're at the computer or at the TV or at the supermarket or whatever, don't give the devil an opportunity, a base of operations for him to launch an assault against you. Be wise. And in verse 16 here in 1 Timothy 5, he closes that section. He says, If any believing man or woman has widows, let them relieve them or give aid to them, and do not let the church be burdened, that it may relieve those who are really widows. You know, the families need to take care of them. Don't put that burden on the church. and Make it hard to care for those who are really in need. And that's the third time Paul dealt with that. You know, he said in verses 4 and 5 here of 1 Timothy 5, if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents. For this is good and acceptable before God. Now she who is really a widow and left alone trusts in God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. In verse 8. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And verse 16 is what we read. If any believing man or woman has wills, let them relieve them, and do not let the church be burdened, that it may relieve those who are really widows. It's something that we need to heed as a church and as individuals. We need to be wise in the things we support and the people that we help out. Because there are those who will take advantage of the church. And, you know, I try to err on the side of grace. But there are times that I know that they are not telling the truth. They're just trying to get something for nothing. We just, you know, we had a, a lovely woman who's in a bad relationship. What was it, two days before Christmas? Or the day before Christmas, that's right. It was um, Christmas Eve. Didn't have any presents for her children. Father was in jail for abusing her. And she called and she didn't know what to do. I said, I'll tell you what. Text me a list of the ages, sizes, what they want. And we'll see what we can do. It's Christmas Eve. I didn't know what would be open, you know. Um, but right after church, Julie and I went out and got all the presents, wrapped them up. And, you know, it was like the North Pole. You know? <laughs> and uh, told her, we're here. If you can come, we'll get you the presents. And she came. And, you know, she was really blessed by it. And we tried to encourage her, you know, um, that we love her and uh, God loves her. And I think that's really important. You do the best you can to help people. And we need to have respect in the family of God. It is so important. It is so important that the night before Jesus was crucified, do you know one of the things he was praying for? 
unity in the body of Christ. Isn't that amazing? Think about that. Of all the things he could be praying for, he's praying for unity. In, Matthew, or in John chapter 17, he said, I do not pray for these alone, meaning the, his apostles, those disciples, but also for those who believe in me through their word. That's all of us that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. You see, Unity is based on the truth, and Jesus, in Matthew 17, 17, said that your word is truth. So, as the scriptures teach us, Jesus is the one who unites us together in the family of God. And apart from him, there's no unity. And so, here we are, called to love one another. And that love, then, is manifested outwardly as the world looks at us and they see that kind of love and they go, man, you know, and and think about it. When it's so dark out there, when people aren't loving each other and they see a group of people that have this love for each other, they desire that. Why? Because don't we want to be liked? Don't we want to be loved? Absolutely. That's just human nature. We are to love one another as God has loved us, the respect in the family of God. And I'll, I'll close with this. It's a song that goes, I'll, I'll keep your secrets. And just listen to the words. It goes like this. I'll keep your secrets, I'll hold your ground. And when the darkness starts to fall, I'll be around there waiting. When dreams are fading and friends are distant and few, know at that moment I'll be there with you. I'll be around when there's no reason left to carry on. And every dream you've ever had is gone. And the dark is deep and black without a sound. And every star has been dragged to the ground. Know at that moment I'll be around. Wow. Are we aware of what our brothers and sisters in Christ are going through? Are you aware of what the person next to you is going through? How do I find out? Communication. (laughs) You talk to each other. And you then have prayer a prayer list of what you could be praying for for that person. Show that you care for them. Build them up in the faith. And I'll close with this, I promise. It's what Solomon said in Proverbs 17, 17. In fact, when I was the nursing supervisor back in Illinois, on all my uh, evaluations for all the pe- people that were I was overseeing, I would put these words, Proverbs 17, 17. And they always asked me, what does that mean? I said, get out your Bible and look. And this is what it says. A friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. I like that because it says a friend is born at all times. Our friend loves, excuse me, at all times. All times. The good times, the bad times, he's always there to love, and even and especially in those bad times. My prayer as we go forward is that the love of Christ would not only fill our lives, as Paul talked about in Romans, but then it wouldn't, it, it, we don't want to be a container to hold the love of God. We want to be a channel for the love of God to flow through and touch the lives of others. Because a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, it's not always easy. And that's why we can't do it on our own. Because the flesh loves to get in the way and to do things that aren't right, say things that are not right, and to justify why we're doing what we're doing. But you come along and say that we're to love at all times. That we are to have that love that you have that's unconditional. Help us, Lord, to reflect that kind of nature that only comes from you because we can't do it on our own. It's supernatural. 
and reach many people, not just our brothers and sisters in the Lord, which is so important, but the people around us, the unsaved Lord as well. We love you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.